Hello, and welcome to the inaugural episode of The Security Angle, our webcast focused on all things security. Today, I am so excited. I'm joined by a member of our Cube Collective family of analysts, Joe Peterson. Joe is an engineer, she's an analyst, and she is a brilliant mind. And I am relatively certain that anybody know, who knows her would agree. I'm so glad to be collaborating with you, Joe. Welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here, Shelley. Absolutely, absolutely. So in this series, you can expect interesting, insightful, opinionated, <laughs> and timely conversations on all things security, including security news, security management strategies, cloud security, AI security, security technology, you name it. And, and also, you know, we will um, provide coverage on some, what some of the major vendors in the space are doing on the cybersecurity solutions front. So each week we'll cover a handful of topics. We'll feature an occasional guest. And we're always interested, of course, in your coverage suggestions. So if you're watching, or listening, welcome. And don't hesitate to reach out and send us your ideas on things that you'd like covered. So with that, we're going to dive into our first topic, which is a pretty important one. It's about the challenges that are involved in protecting critical infrastructure. Joe, I know this is something that you spend a lot of time thinking about. I do as well. Let's talk a little bit about that cyber attack on the water authority near Pittsburgh. Yeah, that was kind of scary. And I didn't know until I dug into it. And I want to read a stat here because I think it's kind of important um, that the private sector owns the vast majority yeah. of the nation's critical infrastructure and key resources, roughly 85%. And so when we think about, you know, key infrastructure, it's all the things that we use every day, yeah. our water, our electricity you know, things that keep the world going. Transportation so, systems, right? I right, mean, right. all of these things. Right. And so, um, you know, processing food, right? I, You know, that's part of the, the infrastructure. And the government has tried. So back in 2010, the Government Accountability Office made 106 recommendations in this area, or since 2010, I should say. Um, 57% of those recommendations had not been implemented as of December of 2022. That's cringeworthy. Yeah, it is. Um, and I get it's a balance, right? We're going to talk about that. That's going to be, I think, a theme as we talk today through some of the things that we talk about, sort of that balance between government and the rights of a private entity and how much you know, a government can step in and, and mandate, right? Um, but the other side of it is as, as good, diligent business owners with a fiduciary responsibility to the public that they serve, what are these organizations doing to make sure that this critical infrastructure is secure? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, when I was preparing for this and I was looking at this topic, I, I ran across a 2022 waterfall security report that indicated a 140% increase in cyber attacks against industrial operations that have resulted in more than 150 incidents. And by the way, I'm sure that, you know, that number is probably smaller than it is in reality. Right. Um, but, but what, got my attention was that the in, the researchers warned that at this growth rate, they expect cyber attacks to shut down 15,000 industrial sites by 2027. And even more alarming to me anyway, is that 17% 17 of the attacks that happened in 2022 had no identifiable motive in many of these. And I know you know these, many of these are just designed to disrupt critical infrastructure or services. And, you know, so when we think about, the, and sometimes I think, you know, the general public doesn't really understand when we talk about infrastructure and how key this is. And I think this actually translates even at the boardroom level. Um, but, you know, think about the attacks on airlines. Many major airlines have had cyber attacks in recent years. In fact, when I was heading to Mobile World Congress a couple of years ago, I ran into, I was a victim of an, 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 an I don't think they talked about this a lot, but 
It was an attack on British Airways that really shut down transportation across the world. It was a mess. So we've had attacks on airlines. We've had attacks on power grids. We've had attacks on auto manufacturing plants. We've had attacks of the Colonial Pipeline attack. The um, You mentioned uh, food. I believe there was a, an attack on a meat processing plant. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an attack on a wastewater facility in Florida. Then There was nothing more than an attempt to really poison people drinking or using the water system. And so anyway, when you think about infrastructure, it's it's a small world a word with massive implications, right? And it, it impacts our health, safety, security, lives, everything in a way that's really a pretty big deal. Yeah. And you brought up, you, you sort of made something perk for me, which was the average person and what they understand. And we talk about the term nation state yeah. attacks, right? Well, so first of all, a nation state attack could take us all down, right? Absolutely. If, if an adversary, right, but, the, but, but I wanna peel back the onion a little bit there. For the folks that don't know, there are company, countries in the world that have people on payroll rows and rows of people <laughs> like in an office you'd yeah. see maybe in new york city or la or chicago of accountants and they have one job right and that job is pack and these people are paid a paycheck yes. by that nation state and they have benefits and they recruit people i mean it is not some kids wearing hoodies in a room trying to be you know, rebels. It is it is grown men and women that this is their job yep. that they clock in for. And Every day. <laughs> it's mind blowing. Like if you think about that, you know, a minute, these are people that spend their entire day trying to hurt the citizens of another country. Right. Or another country in general. I mean, stand still with that for a minute. That, oh, yeah. that makes me feel queasy. It just does. Well, and the other, I mean, when we talk about this, we're talking about China. We're talking about North Korea. We're talking yeah, about Russia. Russia. But yeah. You know, I mean, we're talking about, and, and the other thing is, is that these countries, I mean, I believe that those people who are sitting in a room whose job is to constantly scan for detect vulnerabilities and to launch attacks and things like that. I mean, can you imagine how celebrated they are when they're able to, you know, really yeah. make some damage? I mean, yeah. that's like a very big deal. So it just seems so bizarre to me that that would be something that you would spend all day, every day doing. But you know what? I mean, in we are, in, we in Europe and we are attack vectors. And so understanding that and understanding the reality that there are people there all day, every day, whose job is just to look for weaknesses and, and the stress and the responsibilities, I think that that puts on, you know, companies the world over is really pretty significant. Um, I think that I, I read that in one of the um, the waterfall security report that I referenced earlier that reported 140% increase in cyber attacks against industrial operations showed that 60% of these attacks were led by state affiliated actors. So that's a that's a big number. It is. It, it is a really big number. Um, and when you so a couple of other things, you know, if we think about the solar winds attack, Right. And we think about something people may be familiar with this term and maybe not familiar with this term is called dwell time. And dwell time is the idea that somebody, a bad actor sits inside a system for a really long period of time, just stays there. They're very patient. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> gathers information. Right. And, and so it was determined that the, a solar winds attack was a nation state attack mm -hmm. and it took hundreds of engineers to reverse engineer that and they found it by accident isn't it crazy right they they found it by somebody tried to authenticate i'm going to get the story a little wrong here but they had already authenticated and someone caught the fact that they had already authenticated true 
So it was found by accident. So they're not, sh they're not exactly sure how long that had been going on. And that brings me to something else that I think we're going to talk about. Yeah. Um, and if I'm early, stop me and we'll rewind. But Go right ahead. Um, it, it makes me think about sort of, okay, so if 60% was the number you cited of these attacks being nation state attacks, then, and this was something that came out um, in a talk this week at Black Hat in London. When does it border Sarbanes-Oxley moment? Meaning, when does the government step in and go, mm, enough, just enough? Like, we've had too much and we've reached this sort of inflection point where we have to make some mandates that have to be enforced. Well, absolutely. And, you know, I think this is a great time to transition over to talk about Black Hat Europe. And and uh, I thought it was interesting that so Black Hat Europe took place in London last week. Jeff Moss, Black Hat's founder, predicted that governments will be forced to impose greater levels of security regulation because the reality of it is it's pretty clear that organizations aren't doing a good enough job to protect themselves. And, you know, his quote on this topic was self-regulation is not working. <laughs> and, and, you know, why? And, and so that made me think about, you know, why isn't self-regulation working? And I started doing some research on that front. And, and I know you and I've talked about this a little bit, but it's a boardroom issue. Right. And, you know, I was as so as I was digging into this, I, I found some research. Uh, the Wall Street Journal reported on a study that was done by a VC firm, Night Dragon and the Diligent Institute, which is a research think tank arm of a software developer named Diligent. And this was done in September. And uh, they did an analysis of board competition in the S&P 500 companies. And it, this research found that 88% of these companies had no directors with cybersecurity expertise. I mean, how this is a board level problem. Yeah. Um, you know, further, they found that only seven of those S&P 500 companies had a current or former CISO on board. And, in, and out of those seven, two were the same person. So, you know, we're, we're in a situation where we have boards that are comprised of people that have no knowledge or expertise at all as it relates to cybersecurity. And then we wonder, why is this problematic? Well, I think we have our answer. That's a really good point. The other thing I think about, and I know there's lots of CISOs that I'm aware of that do their absolute best to talk to the board and really present security in a way where it's a business problem and not a tech problem. Right. Really try hard to get security seen as integral to business and not a cost. Right. Right. And they do all these good things on the daily. They do. But there's a couple things that drift into my mind. And the first is, and these are just realities, Cybersecurity is only a small percentage of an IT firm's or an IT budget. It's just a small percentage. Depending upon the vertical that you're looking at, um, the percentage is larger. So those verticals that are highly regulated, think finance, spend more on cybersecurity. But even right. then, it's 12 to 15% on average of the entire IT budget, okay? That's even with the regulations. And finance, the finance folks, the hospital folks, the guys that have the most and gals that have the most regulations spend the most. That's the first thing. The second thing that I'm gonna say that's kind of inflammatory and mea culpa in advance. You inflammatory? Is, no. Well, yes, <laughs> um, yes, is how can you expect a CISO to do a good, good job if they are, if they report to a CFO that doesn't want to spend any money? Right. I'm just going to ask the question, boys and girls. I'm, I'm just going to ask because this person can only do so much. Right. You know, I made my own prom dress. It wasn't pretty. I didn't have much to work with. Okay. <laughs> These guys and gals have these tiny little budgets to work with. And we wonder 
why the average tenure for a CISO is two years. Right. Because well, they, they feel like they can't affect any change and it's very stressful and very frustrating. Well, speaking of stress, I mean, you know, think about, um, you, you mentioned solar winds, the CISO of solar winds, you know, is in a situation where he's been charged um, because of the breach, right? I mean, like when you think about that for a minute, so think about, um, think about culpability in when you have a massive attack, a massive breach. Um, think about this, you know, if something happens and of course there's damage done and there's, you know, a stock drop and everything else. Well, if we're going to charge CISOs, are we also going to charge board members for not paying attention? You know, I mean, this is a bigger issue and a bigger responsibility than just the one that sits on the CISO's shoulders. This is a corporate wide responsibility. And, and I think that that's really, you know, kind of uh, what, Jeff was talking about a little bit when he was talking about, you know, this is a problem and self-regulation isn't working. It's a boardroom issue. And, and you know, and really that leads to the reality that you, know, you and I talk about this all the time. Security is, is and should be a foundational thing across every organization of every size and everything everybody does should be security first in my in my opinion and i know that that maybe isn't echoed by everyone out there but the the risks to the business are so significant that you really can't not have a security first mindset and that, you know, making cybersecurity, not just a CISO responsibility, not just an IT run responsibility, a senior leadership responsibility, a board level responsibility, and really across the organization, everybody involved really needs to understand the importance of data protection, the importance of, you know, of having the right technology, of having the right practices, of regular and ongoing training. You know, there's so many pieces here and all of them are important. Yeah, I don't think it's black and white as socks, personally. Yeah, no. no, it's not. You know, socks is financial and that's pretty black and white, but in there becomes all this area of gray in my mind. So let's go back to the CISO and it's, it's well, maybe this is a second point, but Let's go back to the CISO that goes to the CFO, that reports to the CFO and says, you know, man, we really need MFA. And the CFO says, no. Should that CISO be held accountable? Because at the end of the day, they can't get budget for what they need. And right. I think it's, and I applaud the cyber insurance firms that come, that are coming down heavier on their clients. Oh, absolutely. Saying, you know what? You need to have this and you need to have this and you need to have that in place. Yeah. Well, and I think there I think there used to be a mindset, you know, say within the last 5 years or so, I think there there was a mindset that was not a good mindset but that a we have cyber insurance, so we're good. Right. Yeah. And then, when, but then, you know, when you think about some of the ramifications of some of these cyber attacks, um, you know, some of the biggest cyber attacks. And when you think of kind of the, the ramifications, the public pays the price, <laughs> you know, right. I mean, the public always pays the price, the Equifax data breach, right? All of our information is out there, um, all of those things. So I think that it is, um, I think you make some very good points that, you know, we have, we have the, the perfect storm of lack of understanding, lack of budget allocation, lack of skilled technical help. Yeah. Right? You know, so I think that you have all of these things coming together, playing a role and um, we, we've got to fix it. We we absolutely have to fix it. And, and I think that that sets the stage for our next our next segue here. We're going to talk a little bit about the newly adopted SEC rule that goes into effect in December. And, yeah. um, you know, there's a lot of criticism about this rule. And one of the things that, it, you know, that uh, the 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 writers of this rule have been criticized about is not including um, people from the trenches in conversations as they were making some of these decisions. But, mm -hmm. you know, in short, in July of this year, the SEC adopted some rules on cyber risk management, security, governance, and incident disclosure by public companies. Mm -hmm. This rule requires the disclosure of cybersecurity incidents exp that organizations experience. They have to disclose um, 
on an annual basis material information about their cyber risk management practices, their strategies, their governance, that sort of thing. Well, these newly adopted rules go into effect in December. And I think this is actually both good and terrible um, because I understand sort of the thinking and maybe the heart is in the right place here. But I think that we've got and, and I think that this is not um, not unusual as it relates to what we do in the United States compared to some of the regulations that we see coming out of the EU. Um, we tend to get things, uh, we tend to be a little bit more lackadaisical, I think, in some of the rules and regulations that we put into place. Um, one of the rules here, one of the critics, uh, um, one of the rules here, though, is that the these are pretty demanding um, disclosure rules from the SEC. And one of the requirements is that publicly traded companies have to report cyber attacks um, through regu regulatory filings no less than four days after they determine the attack will have a material impact on their operations. Well, four days is not very much. Mm -hmm. You know, I know you have some thoughts on this, so let's hear it. I, you know, so you said a couple critical things. This is the SEC weighing in. So this is publicly traded companies. Doesn't <laughs> apply to privately held organizations. Or governments. Mm. Or companies of any size doing business with government right. entities. Right. So the heart was in the right place when yep. they when they put this in. Right. And to the way I understand the ruling, it is going to affect two things. It's going to affect that disclosure that you described, yeah. but they also have to describe their process. So it's not the disclosure. Then they have to go and then make another statement um, on their form. Oh, what is it? There's a couple That's, different forms. Yeah. There's a couple different forms involved, right? Yeah. There's and um, item 1.05. Form 8K uh, is the four business days that you alluded to. And then there's a, a SK um, item 106 that says that they have to talk about their process. And there's another piece of the legislation that says the boards have to describe what they knew and were aware of, right? Which I found pretty interesting, right? So there's, there's all kinds of places in here where the I's have to be dotted and the T's have to be crossed. Yeah. Well, and interestingly to me was that one of the changes from the original proposals was the removal of a requirement for companies to disclose the cybersecurity expertise on their boards of directors. I mean, we just talked about this, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And so so when you talk about, you know, I, I can't remember the phrase you just used two seconds ago, but it's like when you talk about, you know, our heart was in maybe it's what you said, our heart was in their heart was in the right place. But come on. I know. And, but, you know, as I read through this and I didn't read the actual uh, legislation itself, yeah. I read a summary of the legislation. But there's words that trigger me in there. Like it says, smaller reporting companies will have an additional 180, 180 days. What defines large and what defines small? Right. Where's the line? So I, I, there's, it seems like it needs some refinement. Yeah. Yeah, it'll really be interesting. And I think that this is true. You know, we're going to talk about this Um in a next episode, we're going to talk about, you know, uh, AI security and the roadmap for trusty AI and, and really comparing some guidelines that are out there on this front. But the reality of it is, you know, I think that it's easy to be a critic. I realize that. It's easy to find, look for and find all the holes, right? Um, I think that this is probably a good step forward. I think requiring some, you know, official um, accounting and things like that. And I'll, I'll put some additional information in the in the show notes here about the specifics of this new, um, the new SEC rules. And so that you'll kind of be able to see what the requirements are. Um, 
you know, I suppose that a first step that isn't perfect is better than no steps. That's right. That's right. And it's conversations like this that I think get people thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's what we want to do. We want to start a conversation. We want to start a conversation. And by the way, if you happen to be a company, whether you're part of the S&P 500 or whether you're part of a smaller organization, step back and ask yourself, you know, what does our board look like? What are yeah. our conversations from the board level and senior executive level? What, uh, you know, how are we addressing and embracing and educating about the importance of cybersecurity and, and examining our own cybersec operations and our risk mitigation strategies? Because that is, you know, th that's, I, I think, the holy grail. That's what we want. Yeah. We, we want there to be increased understanding. We want there to be increased awareness. And we want people to understand, too, that, you know, the reality of it is, and we work with these vendors all the time, whether it's AWS or Cisco or Microsoft or, you know, tons of other vendors who have IBM, um, who have amazing security tech, security related technology solutions that are out there. And, um, you know, I, I remember we did some research for Dell a couple of years ago. And um, one of the things that we asked respondents in that research study was, um, do you have you know, visibility? Do you have a dashboard that shows you in real time what's happening across your security landscape? And many of the people that responded to that survey who were uh, you know, CISOs, IT pros, senior leaders um, said no. And another question that we asked was, you know, how many instances of, of cyber threats have you encountered in the last 12 to 18 months? And the interesting thing, and not surprising at all, thing was that, of course, the people who responded that they didn't have any kind of visibility, they weren't using you know, uh, technology like Splunks or Dells or anything else, they they weren't using technology solutions to provide visibility. They thought that they weren't that they weren't targets and that cyber attacks weren't happening. And the other survey respondents, again, no surprises here, who do have visibility, knew that they were seeing and thwarting hundreds of attacks on a weekly basis. Yeah. So it's happening. And just because you don't, you don't see it, um, doesn't mean it's not happening. And I think that's really where we need awareness and, and the understanding that there are technology solutions out there that can provide the kind of assistance that people need. Yeah. Lots of good ones. So good points. Absolutely. Well, with that, we're going to wrap up this inaugural episode of the security angle. Thank you for hanging out with us and for watching or for listening. You'll find us here every week. Joe, it's always a pleasure to swap gray matter with you. And I look forward to more on that front. Me too. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.